Okay, it's 11 o'clock. I think I'm due to start. Um, my name is uh, Jonathan Walton. I'm a director at Whitley Stimson. On behalf of Whitley Stimson, uh, please uh, let me welcome all of you to the uh, Construction Industry VAT Reverse Charge uh, presentation by Neil Owen. Um, oddly enough, about 20 years ago, I took some advice from Neil about the reverse charge for uh, invoices from Ireland. So it's not a new thing altogether in concept, but of course, this is all very new for the construction industry. Um, Neil is a seasoned VAT practitioner, a VAT specialist. I think that's all you deal with actually is VAT and uh, the, the multitude of legislation that surrounds it. Neil started off at Customs and Excise for a number of years um, and then went to private practice. He's now very well known on the lecture circuit and uh, we go to him with all of our very difficult technical queries. The, um, there's a question and answer session that's to be at the end. You'll see within uh, Zoom here that you have uh, questions and answer box. You can ask your questions as you go. Um, they'll kind of get stored up um, and then they'll be dealt with at the end and I'll give you the timings in a second. There's also a uh, technical, uh, there's a chat box um, and if you have any technical issues uh, such as I did when we first uh, did this this morning very early on um, when uh, my marketing lady said to me Jonathan the rest of us can get in so it could, just must be you um, but if you have any technical issues please go to the chat box and enter them there. The timing is that we're going to start in a minute, um, then at 12.15 uh, we'll have a, a brief comfort break and then at 12.20 we'll resume for the questions and answers uh, for Owen. Um, and finally, we are uh, recording this, but only um, in the context of the presentation from Neil and the bit I've just done and the questions and answers won't be recorded at the end. Uh, and of course, nobody's faces or names are, will appear anywhere, but we thought we ought to tell you out of politeness. So over to Neil for the presentation. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, talking about this important new development in the world of VAT. And I suppose really I should just get straight underway um, by explaining and just amplifying a little bit probably what Jonathan's already said the reverse charge is not something that's new but its application within the construction sector very much is so let's get straight underway and uh, let's just talk very briefly about the reverse charge as a concept and you will hear the construction sector reverse charge often talked about as a domestic reverse charge or DRC. The reason for that is that the reverse charge applies between parties who are both in the same jurisdiction who are domestic because they're in the same country. This is fundamentally different from the cross-border reverse charge that Jonathan mentioned a moment or two ago. That's been with us for a long time but it operates in a slightly different way. This is a domestic reverse charge involving transactions between parties in the same jurisdiction. We've had a domestic reverse charge in the UK for quite a while, actually. HMRC have a public notice explaining how domestic reverse charges generally operate. And here are the sectors in which there is already a reverse charge working within the UK. Now, as you can see, if you just cast your eye over that list, they're all fairly narrow sectors. They don't affect that many businesses across the country. And most businesses they do affect are highly regulated for other reasons and accommodate the reverse charge as part of their normal procedures, really. What's fundamentally new about the domestic reverse charge when it comes to the construction sector is that it's going to affect businesses or a sector of the economy which contains fundamentally hugely more businesses than are ever affected by these on the list on the slide at the moment. So it's going to have a very profound impact across a significant part of the trader population of the United Kingdom. A reverse charge at root is a revenue protection measure. Uh, this illustrates very briefly what it's designed to deal with. Normally we have a chain of transactions involving more than three parties, but three is enough to illustrate the abuse. A sells goods or services and charges 20% VAT to B. Of course, B claims that VAT back as input tax, don't they? Because they're going to sell the same goods or services on to C, also charging 20% VAT. They will collect that 20% VAT from the customer along with the underlying net value. And then, of course, what they're supposed to do is pay that over to HMRC, 
But what happens in this particular fraud, which isn't desperately sophisticated, is that having collected it from C, they then fail to submit their VAT return, disappear and run off with the VAT. And fraudsters have been involved in a number of the sectors that were listed on the previous slide and apparently they're now involved in the construction sector which is why HMRC want to introduce the reverse charge in this sector. So what exactly is the reverse charge? Right? It's, it's basically it's a provision under which the obligation to account for output VAT passes from the supplier to the customer. So instead of the person who makes the sale putting the output VAT on their VAT return, which will then be claimed by their customer as input VAT on the customer's VAT return, the output VAT is declared by the customer and immediately negated, of course, by the input VAT claim they still continue to make. So no actual VAT is paid by the customer to the supplier and that means there's no VAT for a fraudulent supplier to run off with. And to put this another way, the customer pays the VAT directly to HMRC, although they claim it back at exactly the same time, so they don't feel as if they're ever paying it at all, rather than paying it to their customer and claiming it back from HMRC through their VAT return. And the reason why it has to be done this way, rather than simply saying, well, if A supplies services to B, and we don't want there to be VAT for anybody to run off with, then why can't we just zero rate them and there wouldn't be any VAT? That's because UK and European law say that if it's a standard or a reduced rated supply, the VAT has to be accounted for to HMRC. So to put that in pictorial terms, here we have an ex in example of A supplying services to B at a value of £10,000 with a rate of VAT at 20%. Here is A's VAT return where they're showing net sales in box six of £10,000 and they're paying £2,000 of VAT over to HMRC, which they've charged to B and B then claims that back in box four of their VAT return as input tax and has a purchase in box seven of their VAT return which is the, the net purchase. So this illustration, of course, only shows the one transaction. In reality, the VAT returns will have many other transactions on them. But the implication of the reverse charge is simply this, that this £2,000 here moves from A's VAT return to B's VAT return. And that is the reverse charge. And that's then afterwards what those returns then look like. So there's actually no output VAT on A's VAT return. They still retain the £10,000 as a sale in box six. That doesn't pass to the customer. And anybody who's familiar with the cross-border reverse charge will know that that net figure passes to the customer as well in a cross-border reverse charge. In a domestic reverse charge, only the VAT passes as this slide illustrates. So the £2,000 has gone from A's VAT return to B's VAT return, appearing in box one there instead, netting itself off against the input tax claim, which is still made in box four, giving us a nil VAT liability in respect of this single transaction, a nil net VAT liability for both parties, instead of a positive £2,000 for A and a negative £2,000 for B. So the principle behind all of this, once we've seen how the mechanics actually operate in that way, is that the supplier charges no VAT. But they must still take responsibility for identifying the rate of VAT and the amount of VAT to the customer. And they must also, on the sales invoice that they issue, notify the customer that it is their responsibility to account for that VAT as output tax. And HMRC say you can use whatever words you like to describe that on the invoice. It's not set out in the legislation or in HMRC's guidance, except by reference to three examples that they give as to how that might be done. But nonetheless, the supplier has to put that requirement 
on the invoice telling the customer the VAT amount. The customer doesn't determine the VAT amount, the supplier still determines the VAT amount, but the customer declares it as output tax and, of course, claims it as input VAT. I've already said this, but just a reminder, the net value of the sale remains with the supplier, still goes into box six of their VAT return as taxable turnover. The new provisions are coming in on the 1st of March 2021, but well, assuming they're not put back again because of the ongoing coronavirus crisis, I think HMRC will be very reluctant to postpone it yet again. And we hope that things will improve enough, but if there's a really difficult winter, it's not impossible it could be put back further. Uh, I have no inside knowledge, by the way. I'm assuming it's coming in then, but I just don't think anybody can be 100% certain as things stand at the moment. HMRC have published some guidance about the application of the reverse charge. They've issued some in June 19, which they've updated several times since, and they published a technical guide in September of this year in which they made one or two fundamental changes to the way in which they'd originally announced that this would work. The intention, the intention of these provisions when they were originally announced, and I think broadly the policy intention still, although it's not how it works in practice, is that the reverse charge would apply to supplies between building contractors. So in order for the reverse charge to be applicable to a supply of construction services, the customer of the supplier needed to be somebody who was going to sell construction services on to someone else, not someone who is going to absorb them into their own business activity or into their own property. Now, the way in which the rules have actually been implemented means that in certain circumstances, that objective is not actually achieved. And I'll explain that as we go through. But if you look at the original announcements and so forth, you will see that that was what HMRC were originally aiming for. So just to give you that in, again, we're in pictorial form. This is what they said at the beginning was the aim of the exercise. We have, and of course, there may be more in the chain than I'm illustrating, but four gives me what I need to explain the principle, a sub subcontractor who supplies construction services to a subcontractor, that should have been subject to the reverse charge and, in, and indeed subject to the conditions will be. The subcontractor then makes supplies of construction services to a main contractor, again, subject to the reverse charge. That's what they said would be the case. We then have the main contractor working for the end user, somebody who owns the property where the work is being done. And the intention originally was that VAT should be charged as normal there in every case because the reverse charge did not cover supplies to end users. Actually, as they have changed the legislation and the guidance since this was originally announced, we find that that is not quite how it's actually going to work. It's going to work like this. Sub-subcontractor reverse charges to subcontractor who reverse charges to main contractor who charges VAT as normal to an end user, but only where the end user has confirmed in writing to the main contractor or any other contractor working for them, only where they have confirmed in writing their status as an end user. So if they fail to do that, then actually the reverse charge will apply even on supplies to end users. Now this makes life easier in some ways and more difficult in others as we should go on and see. But in order to know in principle where the reverse charge should stop and in order to know who might issue written confirmation that they are an end user, we need to know what the legislation defines an end user as being. 
And as I've already indicated, actually, it's somebody who has an interest in the land where the work is being done. Usually someone who is not supplying on construction services, they might be selling properties that they've built, not housing because that's not affected by this, but commercial property that they've built. They might be landlords who are charging rent. So they'll be often in some kind of business activity, but they won't be selling construction services. So they're an end user. An end user, and this was originally one of the really, really tricky complications, but it's disappeared slightly as a complication because of the requirement for the reverse charge to be applied now where the end user doesn't declare their status in writing. So that that written status declaration becomes a criterion for whether or not the reverse charge applies, as opposed to the pure status of the customer. But an end user in the legislation is also defined as any company in a corporate group under Section 1161 of the Companies Act with an actual end user. An HMRC calls such a connected company an intermediary supplier. I tend to call them a deemed end user. HMRC's guidance also says they can just call themselves an end user anyway. But that is a further definition. So an end user is either a person of an interest in the land or someone in a corporate group. Not a commonly owned company owned by common shareholders, for example, but a companies under a common holding company, for example, where it's a true corporate group. Any company in a corporate group with a company that has an interest in the land is also deemed to be an end user. And we'll come back to that in due course, but I think it's important that at this stage in the process, we understand exactly what an end user is intended to be. Our next question, to what does the reverse charge apply? Now, I've used the term construction services so far, which is a term that HMRC use. And let me make clear here that in a VAT context, construction services means not just a labour, in other words, true services, but also any materials supplied along with labour. So in VAT terms, we lump the labour and the materials together and collectively call that construction services. And construction services by that definition consisting of any of the things listed on this slide, all of these are very familiar. We would naturally think of them as being services supplied by building contractors or builders. All of those are potentially within the reverse charge. Perhaps a more important question actually is to what services does it not apply? And it doesn't apply when they're supplied in isolation by a supplier of these particular types of service. Two, sign writing, erection of signboards, installation of alarm systems, CCTV and sound systems, installation of seating blinds, shutters, sculptures and murals. Those things are explicitly excluded from the reverse charge. So anybody who operates in those sectors doesn't, isn't going to need to be concerned with the reverse charge. They carry on as they always have done. The delivery of materials to site, even if they've been constructed specifically for the building under construction, that's still a supply of materials, not services. So that will not be covered. And then this was new when the revised guidance, the technical guide, as HMRC put it, to the reverse charge was released in towards the end of September this year. And what they're aiming at here is if only a tiny, tiny bit of a transaction is caught by the rules as we follow them literally, then we don't really want somebody to have to mess around with the reverse charge. So we will say that if the bit that would be caught by the reverse charge, once you follow the rules through, 
is no more than 5% of the total contract, the total supply, then it will not be captured by the reverse charge. Yeah. HMRC didn't make any formal announcement that they were making this change. They just put it in their technical guide for people to find as and when they referred to the technical guide. Now they're calling it 5% disregard. And although I don't want to go into that in too much detail at this juncture, happy to take questions on it later on if it's an area of particular concern. But it seems to me that whilst it simplifies things for some businesses, it will make life rather more complicated for others. A big exclusion from these rules, which is creating some kind of confusion in certain parts of the construction sector already, is supplies by labour agencies. A labour agency supplying carpenters, supplying QSs, supplying individual labourers is not in HMRC's eyes, and I think probably they're right on this point, supplying construction services. An agency doesn't take any responsibility for the work that's done. They simply take responsibility for providing people. And that's a standard rated supply and they should be charging VAT on that. And they continue to charge VAT on it even after these new rules come in, even though they're reporting under CIS, which is another key issue as we shall see. And so both they need to be aware that they need to carry on charging VAT, but their customers who are starting to adapt their systems to say, well, we don't want to pay VAT any, to any subcontractors need to identify the fact that a quote unquote subcontractor, which is a labor agency, is different from any other subcontractor where these rules are concerned. Now there's been a myth that's begun to grow out of the exclusion of labor agencies from the rules, which goes along the lines that, well, labor only is excluded from the reverse charge. No, that's not true. If there's a labor only subcontractor who is VAT registered, then the rules will follow that labor. The reverse charge will apply in qualifying circumstances because they're not a labor agency. They're, they're taking responsibility for the work that they actually do. And it should go without saying, but services of architects, surveyors and so forth are not construction services. And therefore, they will not be captured by these new provisions at all. So when does it apply? And we can answer that question by looking at four conditions. And if each of these four conditions is met, then subject to the 5% disregard, the reverse charge will apply. Condition number one, both parties to the transaction are VAT registered. Clearly, if the supplier isn't, there's no VAT to shift. And if the customer isn't, they've got no VAT return to account for shifted VAT. So that should follow automatically from the way the reverse charge works. Condition number two, the supplier is standard rated or reduced rated in whole or part, but as long as the part is more than 5%. Now that also stands to reason, of course, doesn't it? Because if it's zero rated, there's no tax to shift. And we'll come back to that in a moment, actually. The third condition is that the supply falls under CIS in whole or part. And we'll look again at why they've said in whole or part, and we'll look in a moment at the application of the 5% disregard to that condition. And then the fourth condition is that the supply is not to an end user who has confirmed their status as such in writing. So just amplifying those. And by the way, I have produced my own version of a flowchart, a bit different from HMRC's. They have two flowcharts in their guidance, in their technical note, which one for suppliers and one for customers. Um, my flowchart that will 
be distributed to you after this session is aimed at suppliers but takes you through the decision making process in a slightly different way from HMRC's flowchart. Condition number one, both parties are VAT registered. As I've already mentioned, the reason for that is pretty obvious. Condition number two, the construction services are either standard rated or reduced rated, subject to the 5% disregard. As I've said, if it's zero rated, there's no tax to shift, but this is a good point at which to remark, therefore, that these provisions do not apply in the house building sector unless, along with dwellings, a contractor is also building something like a community centre or is converting an existing building where the reduced rate applies. I also ought to make clear here that in the house building sector, we know, don't we, that there is an element which is standard rated. So a contractor who is supplying and fitting carpets or fitted furniture other than kitchen units or some of the appliances that go into a new dwelling in particular, will need to charge VAT. Now the VAT charge at 20% on those is only on the goods, only on the value of the items themselves. The installation services, remain zero rated. That's a point that isn't always fully understood. But because the VAT is only on the goods, the reverse charge is not going to apply, even if the standard rated element of a supply involving the construction of a new house is more than 5%. A lot of the time it's will fall below the 5% disregard anyway, but even if it doesn't, doesn't mean the reverse charge applies. So if we're only building new residential dwellings under an eligible zero rated contract, we have no need to have any concern about the reverse charge at all. Condition number three, the transaction is reportable for CIS purposes in whole or part subject to the 5% disregard. Now, in many ways, this is going to be a guiding principle for the application of the reverse charge. Because a lot of transactions obviously are not ultimately within CIS. So whilst going up the chain, if there is a chain to the party who supplies the end user, the, the CIS might apply. Many, many supplies to end users are not within CIS, supplies to private individuals who own their own property, for example. And in consequence, as soon as we establish that CIS does not apply, then we also know that the reverse charge for VAT purposes does not apply. But this question of in whole or part is all about making sure that if for CIS purposes only the labour is reportable, for VAT purposes both the labour and the materials fall within the reverse charge because as I said earlier collectively they for VAT purposes are construction services. So when the rules were originally announced what I would be saying at this particular point was we might have somebody who manufactures steel work and who delivers it to site and that's just a supply of materials because someone else fits it or they might deliver steel work and they might fix it now even if the fixing is a small part of the total value of the transaction the actual steel or to use another example, a, a staircase that's been manufactured for a particular property, not residential property, obviously, because we're disregarding the reverse charge there, but a non-residential property or a, a property that's being converted and 5% VAT is applicable. What I would have been saying was, well, it doesn't matter even if the installation, if it's covered that by CIS, but it's only the tiniest proportion of the total, then automatically the whole thing's going to be covered. Now I've got to say, if it is reportable under CIS, the installation service, but it is less than 5% of the total value of labour plus materials, 
then it's not reverse chargeable. And that's probably the reason why they wanted to introduce the 5% disregard to try and prevent the reverse charge from applying when the CIS reportable installation was just a tiny proportion of the whole. So subject to the 5% disregard, however, the CIS is, is a particularly important criterion. This also leads us to the principle that once a supply is in the domestic reverse charge, in part, then everything is in the domestic reverse charge, subject again to this 5% disregard. So I, I just want to pause if you will bear with me for a second, because out of the corner of my eye, I've seen a question that might actually be so directly uh, applicable to this that I could actually answer it now. But let me just have a look. Uh, indeed, it is exactly the example I would be giving here. So we're talking about providing M&E services. And I take it from the question that, that the, the question is this. We are supplying M&E to a whole building, perhaps as main contractor or main subcontractor to the main contractor. But we're buying in various services that contribute to that. Things like the services of electricians but also the services of alarm system installers, for example. And of course, the alarm system installation we saw earlier on is not covered by the reverse charge, but I was clear to emphasize when supplied on its own, it's not. Because the, in these circumstances, when an M&E contractor supplies their whole service to the customer, some of it, the electrical stuff, is definitely within the reverse charge, subject to all the other conditions. And where that's the case, then all of it falls under the reverse charge, which would then include the alarm installation, which if supplied on its own, would not fall within the reverse charge. The only exception to that is where the, where the items which are reverse chargeable are 5% or less of the total contract, which I would not expect to be the case in where M&E services are concerned. So I hope that's answered the question that was up there. Uh, please, if it doesn't, then put extra questions up and I'll deal with them in the Q&A. But it seems so applicable to what I'm saying here and indeed the example on the slide that it seemed to me appropriate to address that at this particular point. So condition number four. And this is the one that's changed with the most recent iteration of the guidance and the amendments to the legislation. A condition for the application of the reverse charge is that the customer has not, in writing, declared their status as an end user to the contractor working for them. So our criterion is no longer what it was meant to be, whether or not the customer is an end user, but rather whether or not the customer has declared themselves to be an end user. Now, of course, and this is only relevant where an end user is CIS registered for some reason. So the transaction is reportable under CIS. So it might be a property developer who is registered for CIS because of the rules applicable in that sector. It might be a deemed contractor for CIS purposes, such as a local authority or a utility company or a housing association, that because they procure so much in the way of construction services over a given period of time, they have to, well, they fall under, would perhaps be a better way of putting it, CIS and the provisions there. So this condition is only going to be relevant where we're dealing with an end user and the transaction is covered by the construction industry scheme. This business about declaring status in writing is quite a tricky one. We'll have to come back to that in due course because in one sense, you could say, well, that's nice and clear because we need something in writing. If we haven't, we know that we apply the reverse charge. On the other hand, 
we need to have some system that identifies whether somewhere in our organization as the supplier we've received that confirmation and that information needs to be available if we're a large organization where the accounts department is slightly remote from the parties who actually arrange the contracts then there needs to be good liaison between them to make sure that we know when that declaration has or has not been made. So next question, when does it take effect? Well, we've, all, we've, we've banded around already the date of the 1st of March 20, 2021. But what does that actually mean in practice? Well, this is all tax point driven using the normal tax point for continuous supplies of services for construction services. So essentially what we're talking about here is a sudden death on the 1st of March 2021. So contracts may be underway on the 1st of March. Invoices up to the 28th of February, current rules. Invoices on or after 1st of March 2021, new rules. Unless payment's been received before the 1st of March, because then payment trumps invoice as the tax point. This goes so far as to say, if we have completed the contract before the 1st of March 2021, and the only thing that is invoiced after the 1st of March or after the 28th of February 2021 is the retention, then the retention invoice needs to follow the new rules subject to whether the contract was covered by the new rules rather than following the rules that applied when the contract was actually performed. Looking a bit further at the mechanics, I mentioned this in brief earlier on in the presentation, but this is just putting a little bit more flesh on those particular bones. The subcontractor charges, let us say, £10,000. And in the past, of course, this is a standard rated supply we're talking about here. It could be reduced rated. So in the past, they'd have said £10,000 plus £2,000, pay me £12,000. Now, what the subcontractor does is to charge £10,000. Notes on their invoice, this is standard rated. All the conditions of a normal VAT invoice need to be fulfilled. But the invoice, instead of charging the £2,000 VAT, says that that's the amount of VAT that is due. And then a narrative appears on the invoice telling the customer, you must account for this VAT on your VAT return as output tax. That narrative can be drafted in any way you wish. HMRC have not, either in the legislation or in their guidance, put a fixed wording on it. They have made three suggestions in their guidance, if, which you can find if you refer to their online guidance about this, but there's no requirement at all to follow any of those three examples. The subcontractor then collects only £10,000 from the customer. This is where it becomes conceptually quite difficult, I think, certainly for, for, for smaller businesses, which have altogether less sophisticated accounting systems and so forth. Subcontractors suddenly aren't going to be collecting, in this example, £12,000 from their customer and paying £2,000 to HMRC. They're just going to be collecting the £2,000 and as it were, forgetting about the £2,000, except insofar as they've got to mention it on their invoices. And so it goes on up the chain until you make a supply to somebody who has declared their status as an end user in writing. Now, of course, it's also true in the construction sector, isn't it, that there's quite a lot of self-billing and there's also use of authenticated receipts in certain parts of the sector as well. And in either of these, 
effectively it's the customer who has responsibility for identifying or not identifying that's not the right word the customer has the responsibility for generating paperwork so self-billing the customer raises the invoice not the supplier so if it's covered by the reverse charge then the narrative will be the reverse of what appears on an invoice issued by the supplier. So it'll say, we, the customer, will account for the VAT and we're only going to pay you the net sum due. But it's always been the case with self-billing and remains the case with self-billing now. Under the reverse charge provisions, I mean that the supplier is the one who is responsible for determining the rate of VAT, the amount of VAT, and whether or not it's covered by the reverse charge. Now, I'm not sure that this point either is fully understood throughout the entirety of the sector. There is the temptation if you receive a self-build invoice to think that the customer must have got it right. So we'll just follow the customer. Some people, I think, even consider that when the customer generates the invoices, then they're the ones responsible for determining the VAT liabilities correctly. But that's not the case. In law, it's the supplier who is responsible. And as a consequence, anybody in receipt of a self-build invoice needs to make sure that they are satisfied that it properly reflects their position both in terms of the VAT chargeable, the amount of VAT, and whether or not it's covered by the reverse charge. So no one should accept a self-build invoice at face value without double checking that it actually does correspond with the correct treatment for the supply that they've made. So where I want to go here is by showing what the implications of these mechanics are for VAT returns and, as we shall see, cash flow of businesses affected by them. So same four parties to a chain of transactions. And this is currently how things work, of course, and I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because it's all very familiar ground, but I want to do this in order to contrast it with what's coming under the new provisions where the reverse charge does apply. So the sub subcontractor in this example charges £5,000 plus £1,000 of VAT on a standard rated contract to a subcontractor who pays them £6,000. The subcontractor, having employed other sub subcontractors as well, charges £50,000 plus 10,000 VAT, 60,000 to the main contractor who pays the subcontractor 60,000. All of these examples are isolated to the individual transactions concerned. I fully appreciate that in reality, there will be lots of other transactions going on as well, but we're gonna move on to look at these individual transactions and how they're individually reported on the VAT returns of the parties. And then the main contractor, assuming that they've had a written declaration from the customer that they are an end user, but actually no, in it at the moment, it doesn't matter. End user status doesn't even matter, does it? They're charging 250,000, 50,000 and being paid 300,000. What that's all about is contrasting it with the same set of transactions involved after the introduction of the reverse charge, which goes like this. Sub subcontractor charges subcontractor 5,000 pounds plus 1,000 pounds of VAT, but only identified as an amount to be paid by the subcontractor. Right? So they're not saying pay me £6,000, they're saying pay me £5,000 and put £1,000 on your VAT return and pay me £5,000. The subcontractor working for the main contractor, £50,000, this is standard rated, put £10,000 on your VAT return main contractor and pay me £50,000. The main contractor invoicing a self-declared end user, the reverse charge does not apply. 
So that's £250,000 plus 50,000 of VAT, 300,000 pounds. Pay me 300,000 pounds. So nothing actually changes at that top level. Of course, a lot of the time, it, that, that top box could almost read self-declared end user or end user where CIS doesn't apply. Because once again, that would be the point at which VAT becomes chargeable in the normal way rather than the reverse charge covering the transaction concern. But what happens then if we have an end user, the transactions within CIS, all the way up to the end user, they're a deemed contractor for CIS purposes, but they don't declare their status in writing. Then actually the reverse charge applies there, the reverse charge applies here, and the reverse charge applies here. So in those circumstances, the main contractor invoices 250,000 and says there's 50,000 VAT on this. You declare it on your VAT return and only pay the underlying sum of 250,000 pounds. So there's assuming CIS all the way through. Then at the top end, there is a big difference depending on whether the end user has declared their status or not. This is actually important for reasons that I'll show in a minute or two. But let me just show you what the impact this has on the VAT returns of the various parties to the chain of transactions. And I'm not needing to explain in great detail the left hand side here, because you'll all be familiar with the net value of the transaction being in box six, the VAT being declared as output VAT in box one and the input VAT being claimed on the purchase that's been made. So the subcontractors box four figure of a thousand pounds is the amount that's being claimed back on the purchase from the sub subcontractor in this example, which again is isolated to individual transactions. So after the introduction of the domestic reverse charge, it looks like this. The sub subcontractor charges £5,000 and says put the £1,000 on your VAT return subcontractor. So they no longer got output VAT. Uh, they, they will of course in reality have input VAT in box four because there'll be other purchases, motor running costs and purchases of materials and all that sort of thing which may mean if everything they do is covered by the reverse charge you can see already that that might mean they're claiming money back from HMRC rather than declaring a net amount to HMRC on each VAT return. The subcontractor is in a very similar situation because well, they're not declaring their own output VAT, they're £10,000, that's moved up to the main contractor. They're declaring their sub subcontractors £1,000, claiming it back as input tax. So once again, they've got, in respect of these given transactions, a nil VAT liability in box five. And then, assuming that the end user has declared themselves in writing to be such, or the transaction is not at this level within CIS, then the main contractor will charge VAT in the normal way. So they will charge £250,000 and charge VAT of 50000 which they'll account for as output VAT in box one, along with the VAT they've reverse charged from the subcontractor below, which is an extra £10,000, that's £60,000. Therefore, in box one, in reality, be more because they'll use other subcontractors as well. Box four will be the amount of VAT on the reverse charged supply from the subcontractor, meaning that their net tax due is now £50,000 and in this example £10,000 higher than it was before the introduction of the reverse charge. So as you can see it reduces the VAT liability of everybody who's in this chain until it gets to the person where the chain stops, at which point it increases their VAT liability, which actually improves their cash flow 
at the expense of anybody below them in the chain. I just want to do this really quickly to show that where you've got a self-declared end user, oh, sorry, that's there's a mistake on the slide for which I must apologize because that's supposed to read an end user who's not declared themselves as an end user in writing. And at that point, the reverse charge applies. So they end up not having to pay VAT down to the main contract and not having to wait to claim it back on their VAT return and with a reduced VAT liability on their return. So to them, it's actually cash flow advantageous for the reverse charge to apply. And that is one of the big factors in all of this, the cash flow implications. It's cash flow disadvantageous to suppliers because instead of collecting 120% of the value of their sales from their customers and holding on to that 20% until they submit a VAT return, it's just not there. It takes the VAT out of their cash flow completely. It's cash flow advantageous to whoever at what point in the chain receives services which are not reverse chargeable. So the whole cash flow situation of the construction industry has been affected by, or will be affected because it hasn't come in yet, by these new provisions. They're not just accounting arrangements, they actually have financial implications for businesses in the sector. Many, if most or all of what they do is within the reverse charge, will become repayment businesses. And then they might want monthly VAT returns to get the VAT back as quickly as possible. And HMRC originally said, well, if you want monthly VAT returns from the 1st of March, apply in April 2021, which unless they've got special arrangements for these new provisions, I don't think is right. And HMRC create VAT returns on their system ahead of time. So I think anybody wanting monthly VAT returns, seeing now they're going to need them, needs to apply in December or January and put up with the possibility of a, a one month February return, for example, as the price of making sure that it is in place before the new rules come in. And there'll be some businesses for whom it's fundamentally very important to be able to claim the net input VAT they're suddenly incurring on a monthly basis. There are risks in these new rules, both for suppliers and for customers. The risk for a supplier here is that they apply the reverse charge to a supplier which isn't covered because that then means they failed to charge VAT in the normal way and HMRC could come and seek to collect it from them. And this is where the new provisions which talk about written confirmation of end user status are particularly troubling. So we've got end user who is CIS registered, the transaction falls under CIS. But because it's cash flow advantageous to receive a reverse chargeable invoice, there is no incentive whatsoever for an end user actually to make a written notification of their status. They'd be better off not doing so. But for exactly the same reason in reverse, that it will be better for their cash flow if they do charge VAT, suppliers to end users are going to want to get that written declaration, that written notification of end user status. So we've, we've built in, they've built in to the way in which they finally implemented these rules, unless there's some further change between now and the 1st of March, a potential point of conflict between CIS registered end users and contractors working for them, which I think is very regrettable. And necessarily as a professional advisor, I'm likely to be saying to end users, 
well, make sure you don't notify your status in writing because that's that's better for you. As long as your accounting system will handle the reverse charge when you get reverse charge invoices, then that's got to be better for you. Whereas I will be saying to contractors who are clients who are working for end users, look, do your absolute utmost to make sure that they provide you with written declaration. So we don't really know how that's going to pan out, not least because there is no formal wording to use, no specific document, no certificate or anything like that for end user status. HMRC's guidance again says, look, end user, this is the wording you could use if you like, but it doesn't really matter. You can say it however you want. Suppliers might think about putting terms and conditions in their contracts to say, we're assuming you're an end user unless you formally confirm that you're not. But having it in the terms and conditions is not enough unless the customer has agreed in writing that they accept the terms and conditions. I'm hoping that when transactions are big enough to be covered by JCT contracts, that this issue will actually be covered in the JCT contract, but I don't know for certain. That's just an assumption on my part. Turning it round now, the risk for customers is that they accept a VAT invoice from a supplier who should have reverse charged them because the VAT that's charged on that invoice is wrongly charged and arguably therefore is not deductible as input tax and HMRC finding a claim of such VAT might seek to disallow it. So it also follows that customers who are not end users or deemed end users, as I've defined them, might wish to confirm to their subcontractors that they are not. And say right at the beginning, when they enter into a contract, you must send us reverse charge invoices and we will not accept full VAT invoices from you. We'll reject them because they're not right for the transactions that we're entering into with you. Uh, moving on to a few other practical points now, the credit notes. Credit notes effectively negative invoices, of course. So what we would expect is that if a credit note is issued, then it carries VAT in the same way as the original invoice. But the narrative, of course, will need to be, be adapted because this is no longer output VAT that needs to be positively added to the customer's VAT return in box one, but an amount that needs to be deducted. So different narratives on credit notes from invoices, therefore. Now, some of this might be simple if you've got a, a computerized accounting system, or if it's a self-build arrangement with a customer who generates the paperwork, where this will be semi-automatic. But for smaller businesses, it may be that it's a bit tricky, this aspect, and what I'm suggesting, and so actually our HMRC to give them credit in their guidance, is that anybody issuing credit notes against standard or reduced rated reverse charge invoices could simply omit the VAT altogether, because there's a provision under which a credit note issued against a standard or reduced rated supply between VAT registered businesses where the customer can claim the VAT in full. If both parties agree, there's no need for VAT to be adjusted at either end of the transaction. So you can effectively issue a zero rated or an apparently zero rated credit note against a standard or reduced rated supply. That applies across the board with normal invoicing, but equally could be used as a procedure under the reverse charge arrangements. Smaller businesses on cash accounting have to have regard to the rather unfortunate interaction between reverse charges and cash accounting, because basically the cash accounting scheme is not usable for, for domestic reverse charge transactions. They're excluded from cash accounting treatment. Having said which, 
HMRC, to all intents and purposes, restore the potential for cash accounting for a supplier because they say that they can report tra reverse chargeable transactions when they receive payment. And of course, this is now only a net sale in box six of the VAT return because there's no VAT to go in box one. Customers are supposed to report the reverse charge output VAT according to the date of the supplier's invoice, even if they, the customer, are on cash accounting. So if someone wants to cease to use cash accounting, particularly if they become repayment, because you, there's no point in being on cash accounting if you are claiming money back from HMRC, you might as well do it on an invoice basis and get the VAT back that bit more quickly. But for those with a whole mixture of transactions, only some of which are within the domestic reverse charge, who want to remain on cash accounting for other reasons, then what's supposed to happen is that the reverse charge output VAT needs to be accounted for according to the date of the supplier's invoice and the input VAT claimed accordingly. Now, that either means reporting the whole transaction on an invoice basis rather than a cash basis and having two bases of accounting, or it means, because I'm not entirely sure that this is outlawed by the new rules, you account for the net value of the purchase in the period in which you make payment and you make an entirely separate manual adjustment, journal adjustment, if you like, into the accounting system to put the reverse charge in on the VAT return covered by the date of the transaction itself, the invoice. And we touched on mixed rate projects briefly earlier on. Let me just amplify the position here. It's not at all unusual, is it, in the construction sector for there to be contracts where there's a mixture of rates, so a mixture of 20% and zero or 5% and zero or 20 and five or indeed all three. I quite often encounter situations where all three VAT rates are applicable to different elements of the supply. Now the positive rated elements of such a mixed supply, disregarding house building sector where certain items that I mentioned before are standard rated, the positive rated elements will fall under the domestic reverse charge unless they are 5% or less of the total contract value. So the rever reverse charge invoicing will be required. And it's the supplier's responsibility to apportion between the rates. And I find quite frequently in the construction sector that customers want to determine the proportion of the transaction which should be at different rates on the part of their suppliers. They'll write to them and say, these are the proportions you should use. Now, that isn't right. The only time that the supplier should use those proportions is if those proportions accurately reflect the amount of work that that supplier is carrying out on that project. They should be working out their own proportions. And that applies even when it's self-billing, which can become an area of contention, of course, between the parties. The other point to be made about mixed rate projects, and I've seen this too, is that we do not arrive at a composite rate. Now, just to use a really, really simple example, we don't have a transaction where half of it is standard rated and half of it is zero rated. And so we say the rate of VAT applicable to this contract is 10%. No, what we say is, is half the value of each application, for example, chargeable at 0%, no VAT, half of it chargeable at 20% with the VAT identified. And it's the same thing under self-billing. Each rate of VAT has to have its separate line on the invoice with VAT charged at the appropriate rate. They can't be combined with a combined VAT rate. Now I know this only applies to really, really small businesses, but some 
small contractors are on the flat rate scheme and the implications of that for the reverse charge, or perhaps I should turn that the other way around, the implications for the flat rate scheme of the reverse charge are that it will become questionable whether the benefit exists any longer for many on the flat rate scheme. Flat rate businesses will still issue invoices under the reverse charge if the transactions are covered, just as they currently issue conventional VAT invoices. And if a customer is on the flat rate scheme and they pay out a reverse chargeable transaction, they need to account for the output VAT, which they can't claim as input tax. Now, I think that's going to be pretty rare, actually. But going back to the supplier now, supplies are made under, under the domestic reverse charge must be excluded from flat rate scheme turnover, which reduces the VAT liability for the flat rate business, but also reduces the benefit of the flat rate, which is the difference between the VAT charged and the flat rate actually accounted for, which is supposed to be compensation for input tax. Well, the more the flat rate liability goes down, the less the benefit, the more likely it is somebody's going to want to stop using the flat rate scheme. And certainly if the effect is because most of their business is in the reverse charge, that they become a repayment business, clearly the flat rate scheme is completely inappropriate any longer. But a case by case analysis is required to see those who should stay and those who should not on the flat rate scheme. Now we're getting now into the closing stages of this presentation, but also the less frequently encountered issues that I'm thinking are raised by the new rules. And one of those might be a customer's status changing during the course of a project. An end user ceasing to be an end user, for example, they've, they've partially built out the new development and then they've sold it to somebody else and they've taken a contract to continue the development through to completion. And therefore, all of a sudden, they are effectively a main contractor, if you like, rather than the developer, the owner of the property. Now, in those circumstances, if they've made the end user declaration to start with, then they should notify their suppliers that they are no longer the end user and therefore reverse charge invoices are now appropriate to that transaction. Although it doesn't often happen in my experience, if something went the other way, HMRC say, well, reverse charge treatment should continue afterwards. And of course, with the new rules that say that a customer needs to declare their status as an end user before the reverse charge ceases to apply, then that becomes even clearer because if they don't do that, then obviously the reverse charge does continue to apply. In the event they did actually formally notify change of status, then I think that the rules applicable to that should probably be applied from the point where they do so. So what have we got left? We've got the fact that within these new rules, almost inevitably, many contractors will have two invoicing methods to consider. It's not a case of, ah, from the 1st of March next year, everything's different. We do everything in this new way. We forget the old way because, of course, there may be a mixture of things that are reverse charge one aren't so any contractor however small is going to have to look at each job they do is this within the rules for reverse charge or is it not if it is we we issue reverse charge invoices if it's not we do things the way we always have done in the past we've got businesses like my steelwork manufacturers that i mentioned earlier on who might deliver to site for someone else to install or who might supply and install, and they need to make sure that subject to the 5% disregard, they identify which is the circumstance in any given contract. So they apply the reverse charge when they install as well, but they 
to the whole value of the transaction. They don't apply it, apply it at all, where they simply deliver to site. And you may have contractors too, who are working for end users, some of whom declare their status and some of whom don't. So they've got to decide each time, do we apply the reverse charge or don't we, based on that written notification of status. Now, there's a real footnote here. There are special rules for contractors who are working on multiple sites for the same customer as at the 1st of March, 2021. So I said earlier on, this is sudden death at the 1st of March. Any contract that's underway, which falls under the conditions of the reverse charge, you start the reverse charge invoicing from the 1st of March. But any big contractor who's got multiple contracts with a single customer, rather than having to identify for each of those ones exactly what the position is, there are some concessionary provisions which may allow for a simplified treatment. But since that's so infrequently encountered, really, I'll leave you to look at HMRC's guidance if that happens to be of relevance to any of you. So really, all that leaves me to say before we have our comfort break, before we come back after that for Q&A, and I've got what, at least three questions already waiting to be answered when we reconvene, is the penalty position. There are no penalties specific to the new provisions. Normal penalties will apply, therefore, for errors where there's carelessness with the potential for HMRC as they often do, to suspend penalties on condition that systems are improved to avoid a repetition of the error and so on. HMRC have said they won't charge penalties in the first six months. They'll apply a light touch. Now that light touch is only no penalties. It's not that they won't issue assessments where errors have taken place and VAT hasn't been properly declared. So I'm not quite sure myself how much of a light touch that is, but I suppose we should be relieved that at least penalties won't apply. I mean, six months is a short period for people to get used to these new rules. So hopefully that light touch might be extended a bit beyond six months. But in the meantime, the sorts of errors we might have are somebody claiming input VAT on a VAT invoice they've received for a transaction covered by the reverse charge where, as I said earlier, they shouldn't be claiming it because it's wrongly charged. Will HMRC assess? Will they, after the end of the light touch period, apply penalties? That is an open question at the moment because this is new not just for us, but also for HMRC. And only time will tell what their exact approach is to all of this. The first question here, um, use somebody using subcontractors who are VAT and CIS registered, uh, that you're VAT registered but not CIS because end users are residential, would the reverse charge apply? Now the transaction here is reportable under CIS, I take it, because the suppliers are CIS registered. Now actually let me answer this question a slightly different way because whether or not a party is CIS registered is not a criterion for the application of the reverse charge. It's whether the transaction between the parties is governed by or reportable under CIS that determines the position. So if those transactions are reportable under CIS, then the reverse charge will apply. If they are not, then it won't. And I hope that answers the question, but please do uh, add a supplement if that doesn't make the position clear. Now, uh, my next question, according, uh, regarding HMRC VAT inquiry, if you reverse charge the end user because they did not confirm status to you, then it was not obvious, but HMRC may know the end data, status user, how do you prove no confirmation was received from the end user and will the underpayment of VAT need to be paid with interest stroke penalties to HMRC? And that's a really, really important and significant question because the biggest issue that I see coming out of this fourth condition has the 
customer issued a declaration, have they declared their status in writing, is what does that actually mean? Who declares it? How do they declare it? And that isn't clear. I, I regret to say that is not clear from HMRC's guidance. It is to be hoped that they make it clearer between now and the 1st of March. Because we have the potential for errors to arise in both directions. Don't we? Yes. If HM, HMRC can't assess and charge interest and penalties, well, there wouldn't be any interest in most cases because the input tax is deductible at the other end if it is charged. But nonetheless, there wouldn't be penalties or an assessment if there's been no written declaration made. The problem is how do you prove there's no written declaration, isn't it? So the fact that HMRC know the customer status as an end user cannot in and of itself be a rationale for them issuing penalties or, in, or an assessment. But I suspect that there will be disputes over whether a certain document, a certain email, a certain form of wording has actually achieved a declaration of end user status or not. That's not something that here and now today I can resolve. All I can really say is that I perceive, as indeed you do, asking this question, that there is going to be a serious problem around that. It's all fine and dandy if the customer actually provides a declaration using roughly the wording that HMRC say they might use. And they routinely give that to all contractors working for them as a kind of formal declaration, almost a sign of in-house certificate that they use, that's great. And if they do, then we know that the reverse charge doesn't apply. But if they don't do that, at the moment, we don't know exactly what amounts to a suitable notification or not. And it is probably the biggest unanswered question with this whole regime. And I'm sorry, that's not a particularly definitive answer to your question. But it's, it's not for want of desire on my part to give a definitive answer. It's because at the moment there isn't one. Uh, next question is supply and installation of solar panels under power supply and therefore a reverse chargeable service. Now there is some, in HMRC's technical guide, there's some mention about various uh, less mainstream types of transaction, if you like, um, which you might want to refer to in this particular context. But assuming that you've gone through the conditions that I've mentioned and come out with the answer, then solar, um, it, the solar panels are not under the excluded categories like CCTV, for example, or alarm systems. So my presumption is that they will be in rather than out, subject to the conditions, of course. Uh, an observation here from somebody just saying that what a shame Brexit can't make all construction services zero rated. Um, yes, it would indeed. I completely agree, be so much easier. Um, but they're actually, when you look at the whole construction and development sector as a whole, there's a fair bit of VAT charged, which is not claimable. And therefore it produces significant amounts of revenue for the Treasury. And I don't think zero rating is something that they would want to contemplate. We did have it. And I don't know if, if your involvement in the sector goes back far enough. But between the introduction of VAT in this country in 73 and 1984, zero rating applied to a huge amount of construction and improvement work in the building world. But that disappeared uh, in the 80s and progressively it's got more complex since then. Um, next question, subcontractor in the construction and civil industries, usually the bottom of the chain. 
Uh, should I get formal confirmation from the contractor customer that works do fall within CIS? We don't do this at present. The answer is yes. I think with bearing in mind the importance of CIS to these new provisions, then uh, and HMRC's guidance also says this, that checking the status of the other party to a transaction for CIS purposes has become a significant factor. As they also say, checking the VAT registration status is, although for what it's worth, I, I think that's probably uh, not something that's quite so important because most of the time it's pretty clear if someone's VAT registered and that they are validly so. But uh, yes, so the answer to that is, is yes, you need to, um, to check the status of the other party to the transaction for both those purposes. Uh, labour and fixings are supplied goes the next uh, question to a zero rated domestic house builder. Um, so this will not be part of DIC, but if the same labour has to carry out customer care for the house builder, once the house sale is completed and residents have moved in, VAT is currently charged at 20% for this. So am I correct in thinking that customer care invoices will fall under the new DRC? Now, that if I'm right in understanding what sits behind that question, this would be, does it apply if those post-completion invoices are for work done, which is invoiced to the developer, well, clearly, if they're invoiced to the householder, then they won't be within DRC. If they're invoiced to the developer, then absolutely yes, they will fall within the reverse charge. Now, that then raises the question. One of the questions I've had in my mind about this 5% disregard. If that work is done pursuant to a much larger contract with the property developer, the house builder, and it was envisaged from the beginning of the contract rather than being a supplementary sort of subcontract, if you like, which actually is a transaction in its own right, then potentially if it is below 5% of the total value, it could be excluded by the disregard, which would mean that VAT would be charged in the normal way. And that question has very well illustrated one of the problems that is going to arise because of this 5% disregard, which was supposed to help businesses. In fact, I don't think it's going to help them. I think in some cases like this, it makes it more difficult. I mean, I have actually been working with a a large groundworks contractor who works for the big house building outfits in this country in recent weeks, months even, they had a VAT visit and a lot of their VAT needed to be adjusted as a result. But they do a lot of work where maybe they're doing the groundworks for 120 houses and they're also doing the groundworks for a community hall and so there's an element of standard rating in all of the zero rating now this isn't an add-on like the post-completion works you've asked the question about but sometimes that standard rated element might be 3.72 percent of the total contract and sometimes it might be 6.14%. And so what we're saying for that business now is you've got to decide, you've got to identify this percentage. You need to anyway. But if it's 6.14, then you have got to reverse charge it. Whereas if it's 3.65, you can continue to charge VAT. So that makes their accounting really tricky, actually, knowing what to apply at what particular stage. Now, next question. Labour and fixings are supplied to a zero rated domestic house builder. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I beg your pardon. I started to read the same question again, haven't I? Let me just scroll down um, to the next one. Um, 
receive part payment before tw March 21st of March 2021 or remainder after this date, how do you treat it? And that depends on whether you've issued an invoice. If you issue an invoice on or before the 28th of March and you receive payment, part payment at different dates, then the payment is irrelevant because the invoice has fixed the tax point. If, on the other hand, you're not issuing invoices until you receive payment, then part payment before the 1st of March, you issue a VAT invoice. Part payment received then afterwards, followed by your invoice, that will be covered by the reverse charge. Fit out offices for end users. They rarely have any understanding of CIS or construction related rules. Would be expected to supply them with DRC invoices if we don't get written confirmation of end user status from them. Um, <laughs> I, I, I imagine, but correct me if I'm wrong on this particular point, that most end users contracting for office fit out services will not receive sufficient in the way of construction works during the course of a given period of time to become deemed contractors for CIS purposes. So I would think that that potentially would in the main be subject to VAT invoices in the normal way as it always has been simply because that transaction between you and that end user is not covered by or reportable under CIS. Now, HMRC don't, at least my recollection is that in their guidance, they don't make clear what the position would be if somebody has triggered a requirement to be a deemed contractor for CIS purposes, but hasn't actually recognised that and hasn't registered. Now, in the circumstances where that's the case, then my default would be to charging VAT on the basis that it is not being reported under CIS. And I think that's also the position that any supplier should take anyway. Remember that the better position for a supplier is to charge VAT where they shouldn't, rather than not charge it where they should. So in those circumstances, to issue a full VAT invoice, there is no risk for the supplier to speak of. The customer, if they should be CIS registered and should be receiving a reverse charge invoice because they haven't declared end user status, they'll be the ones who would be denied input tax deduction on that invoice. And if they've got their act together properly, any customer to whom a VAT invoice is issued for a transaction which should come under the reverse charge will be well advised to refuse that invoice. So there's a sense in which a supplier is better off charging VAT and expecting the customer to refuse it if they believe it's reverse chargeable, if there's any doubt over the situation at all. Um, so next question, we invoice in full for each stage payment, including retentions, but send the customer a dummy invoice net of retention, which they then pay. This means we have a debt of balance for each customer on our ledger, which is cleared at the end of the retention period when we send the final dummy invoice for the retention value. Um, it's a mechanism so we never forget to chase the retention money. Now, this brings me actually to something that I didn't amplify when we, I was talking earlier. There are actually two distinct ways of dealing with retentions for VAT purposes, and it depends which one's used, what the implications of the reverse charge are. So. If the retention is deducted before a net sum is arrived at on which VAT is charged on each application, so that VAT hasn't yet at the end of the job been charged on the retained element, then obviously it follows when the retention is released that a full VAT invoice under current rules will be issued to cover for that. Now that it's quite clear under the VAT regulations that the VAT that's charged on that retention invoice is only due when the retention invoice is issued. So if that's the mechanism that's being used, then the reverse charge would apply now to retentions released on or after the 1st of March 2021. 
But the other way of dealing with retentions, which I think is what you're talking about in your question here, is where you invoice for the, the total sum plus VAT. Calculate the retention and deduct that from the gross, including the VAT on the full amount. So that then the retention, the VAT on the retention has already been accounted for when the invoices were issued on the on the basis of each application and there's no more VAT to account for when the retention is released and if that's what the dummy invoice is doing it's just saying here is an identification of how much money you owe us even though we invoiced you it for VAT purposes way back when we requested the application or when, when we submitted the application I mean then there will there'll be no there won't be any requirement either to issue an invoice a proper VAT invoice or to account under the reverse charge at the point of release of the retention. So well, I hope that answers the question. But as I've said to other questions I've looked at, um, do quickly put something in the Q and A box if I haven't, so that I can address any residual question marks. Um, Um, oh, sorry, there are a couple of supplementaries. I apologise, I didn't see those two. Um, so I, I think I probably answered the supplementary questions there, but um, crediting the retentions and re-invoicing when they actually fall due is probably not necessary if VAT, well, it isn't necessary if VAT has been charged on the pre-retention sum as each application has been made and agreed. And invoiced. Uh, final question that I've actually got up here at the moment um, addresses the question of checking a customer's VAT registration number. Um, many of you will be aware and those that aren't I can tell you that there is a European website where all VAT registration numbers of all VAT registered businesses throughout the EU are held. That system can be interrogated by anybody and if you want to find the relevant website, then the easiest way of doing so is to type two sets of capital letters into a search engine. Those two sets of capital letters are VAT, and there's a surprise, and the second separate set of capital letters is V-I-E-S. Uh, that's uh, V as in VAT once again, uh, and then S at the end, S for sugar, V-I-E-S. So type those two in, you get the European database of VAT registration numbers, put in your member state, put in the VAT number, it will tell you whether it's valid or not. And for many member states, including the UK, will tell you to whom that VAT registration number has been allocated. Now, once we cease not only to be part of the EU, but to behave as if we were a member of the EU, then the presumption is that UK VAT registration numbers will be removed from that site. HMRC are indicating that there will be a domestic database which will replace the EU's database for UK VAT registration numbers but we do not have any details at the moment of where that will be held or how to access it. But it is very much to be hoped that that will happen on or before the 1st of January 2021 in order to enable us to uh, continue checking VAT numbers, not just in the context of the domestic reverse charge if we feel we need to do it for that purpose, but also in the context of other transactions where we might want to look up a VAT registration number. So that answers that question. And it also brings me to the end of the questions that have been asked so far. So I think probably what I should be doing now is asking if anybody else, oh, wait a minute, no, uh, there's something else, looks as if it's popped up. Let me scroll down. Yes, indeed. Oh, thank you very much, three more. Um,
when an application is there is processed and a certificate is issued with VAT included, am I right in hearing that we should then not request a VAT invoice? Now, This must be a customer. Sorry, let me just get my head around this particular question. So an application is made, certificates issued, VAT is shown on the certificate because that's the certificated VAT amount. But it is always the case that that certificate is not in itself a VAT invoice. So any transaction which has been subject to an application and the amount has been certificated will need to be covered either by a VAT invoice or a reverse charge invoice. But because as I say, the certificate itself does not stand for a VAT invoice. In circumstances where self billing is involved, the self-billing invoice, either under the reverse charge or under normal VAT accounting, will be the tax document, but the certificate itself is not a tax document. Um, so I have another question here. With a subcontractor who's not VAT registered, do we need still to stop their 20% and file via the HMRC portal and issue their CIS statement? Um, the answer to that question, I am no expert on CIS. I'm learning a bit more as it interacts with VAT, but it's not an area of expertise of mine. But it is fundamentally completely clear that the VAT treatment is independent of CIS. So the CIS rules will continue to operate exactly as they do today after the introduction of the VAT reverse charge. So whilst the reverse charge is tied in some ways to CIS, CIS is not tied in any way to the construction sector VAT domestic reverse charge. I hope that answers the question. And uh, uh, I have to keep scrolling down to find if there are more. Um, now a very, somebody's now asking about um, accounting systems, it's very simple accounting systems. How will it affect that? Well, that, that is one of the concerns about these new provisions, that they are not so easily accommodated by really simple accounting systems. Now I know that if, if, you're, if by simple accounting system you mean you're operating by reference to your own spreadsheets, for example, and you're issuing invoices manually, then it's merely a case of ensuring that those reflect the transactions in the way I've described during the course of this session and that different invoices are issued according to whether or not the reverse charge applies in any given set of circumstances. If you're relatively simple accounting system is a fairly basic packaged product, a computer system like Sage or QuickBooks or Xero, then it ought to be that that will be able to handle this. Now, I can't speak for any, uh, well, I can't speak for any provider, but I can't speak from experience of or what I've heard about any provider other than Sage who have said they're going to allocate T20 to the construction sector reverse charge provisions on both sides, supplier and customer. And it is very much to be hoped that that, that is also something which is adopted using their particular codes and so on by other small, other software providers who supply packages to small businesses. But uh, other than that, um, I'm not sure uh, how much more detail I can go into asking that question, because it rather depends on the precise nature of the records that are actually kept. But uh, do talk to um, 
whoever uh, Whitley Stimson you deal with over your accounting system, because I'm sure between you and them, some solution could be arrived at for how you can accommodate the reverse charge. I've reached the end of the questions asked, but they have been popping up and I'm just waiting to see if there are any more. But on the basis that we allocated half an hour for questions and we've got to about 28 minutes, that's probably about time for me to hand back to Jonathan. Thank okay, you. well, thank, thank you very much, Neil. Um, uh, you know, your knowledge of that is inspiring, quite frankly. And uh, um, I'm, I'm very happy that we, you were able to go through the, the, the problems that could arise and all the questions and answers so well. It always has amazed me as well that you can actually laugh and smile as you're delivering some VAT seminars and lectures. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Maria and Caitlin and Molly from WS Marketing. Um, they've, they've helped us uh, put this together. And it's been pretty, pretty decent as Zoom presentations have gone. That's been my experience. Um, Willie Stimson, as you probably most of you will know, we're a nine partner for office firm. Um, we, we have thousands of clients, lots and lots in the construction industry. So, you know, we can help you with anything. We've also got a series of other webinars we've had um, on our website from anything from R&D claims through to kind of inheritance tax and wealth planning, etc. Um, but thank you very much for listening. I'll, I'll end by saying that my favourite subcontractor, end user, uh, he's actually been avoiding VAT by installing long rods in toilets. Um, the tax office say it's a loophole they will investigate. Now, I know you're all on mute and I know that all of you now need a comfort break, but thank you very, very much for attending. Uh, and no doubt some notes and things will, will turn up in your email boxes. Thank you.